morning, church. Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. My name is Pastor Tim. If you do not know me, I'm very pleased to have the privilege to stand before you, and also very pleased that we were actually able to go through the book of James together. It's been just great to go through the book of James with the people of God, so I just really enjoyed it. And uh, we actually have two more, including, actually including this one, one more sermon in James, and we will have been through the entire book of James together. Uh, my, obviously, my hope is that we do not just be ears of the, the word, but also doers. And that's the whole point that James has been really just bringing to us through this. Uh, he's given us a lot of theological things to think about. He's given us a lot of practical things that we can we can think about and, and grow for this. I, I hope that you are discussing these things with each other, discussing these things um, with those who are in your, your, your groups or how you guys do things. I know it's on the deconception groups and this and that. Um, but really just discussing these things so they can penetrate our hearts. Amen? Definitely Amen. penetrate to our hearts. I hope you were listening to the music today. It was really, really great. And uh, me and Anthony don't you know, pick songs together because um, I have a life and so does he. But it was amazing that everything that we've been seeing and saying uh, is so true about how God will take care of our needs. Do you believe that? Truly, truly believe that, that God will take care of your needs. I know many of you, so look at your faces, can tell me something about that because you've seen God show up in your life. Uh, but, man, we, do we really believe that God has us, has control over our lives? Is that something good? And also, not just believing that, but also understanding that that is the best place to be in the will of God. Do we believe that? Amen. Amen. You have to believe that. Um, and so that is what James says. When you look at the context of James and the book of James, that is what he's been trying to get across to the people who are being persecuted, is that, yes, you're being persecuted, but at the end of the day, your life is Christ. And um, it's just been really awesome. Last week we discussed, obviously, we talked, if you were here, some of you were here, we talked about selfish ambition and envy and how all of that will just bring disorder in the church, disorder, um, thank you, honey. Disorder, just when you have envy and self, envy and um, selfish ambition, how can you truly love your brother or your sister in Christ? How can you truly be happy for them? And um, James keeps going back on that and going back to that uh, for the simple reason that that is something that we struggle with. That is something that we struggle with, truly being happy for our brothers and sisters, truly um, caring for their needs other than, than ours. But what I like about today's message is that he goes a little deeper, as he always does, to the root of why we do the things that we do, why we act the way that we, we act, why do we lust after certain things, why are we having all this conflict with each other, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. I just want to give you my aim before we start. My aim this morning as we look at chapter 4 is to put every aspect of the Christian life, whether that's our interactions with each other, our planning, uh, our jobs, how we conduct business, putting every aspect of the Christian life under the sovereignty of God. So we're going to be in James 4, verses 11, going over to chapter 5, verse 6. That's James 4, starting with verse 11, going over to, to chapter 5, down to verse 6. And it reads, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother, speaks against the law, and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are a doer of the law. You are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep 
and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotten and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted. And their rust will be a witness against you and will consume you like flesh, consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for just the community of the saints, just the body. I thank you that you created community that we can come together and, and not live this life just by ourselves, Lord. You, we have brothers and sisters who we can help each other live a more pleasing life towards you. I pray as we look at just this, uh, your sovereignty and, and just who you are and who God is and who we are as a people that we'll have a greater love for you and a greater love for the body. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to tell you a story and then... We're going to get into what we've been talking about. Um, typically, when I tell a story, I um, have like my notes so I don't go sway. But I'm just going to just go for it, all right? So, the elders, don't worry. I'm not going to say anything crazy. Um, so, I was in Ohio. With my, my wife is from Ohio. I'm from Louisiana. Uh, one thing that I try to do is to take her home to see her family. We do not have a lot of family here. So, her family actually gathers together. My family does not gather together, so it's not a problem. I don't have to go to Louisiana that much. But my wife, I take her home, and, um, and it's a really great thing. I love seeing, uh, it's really cool that they get together and they really actually like each other. So we go down there about once, usually, to, this was the first year that we didn't go to Ohio. Now, yes, they like each other, but sometimes it can be very overwhelming. So one morning I asked my wife, you know, I'm going to go to the bookstore, it was a Christian bookstore in the area, just in the early in the morning. And she says, that's fine, I did not take any of the kids, it was just me. So as I'm going to the bookstore, I'm at the red light, and right across the street, uh, I see it's a red truck, and I don't know what's going on, but it hits another car, and it hits another car, and then it's coming right at me. Now, there was a car beside me, because I was at a red light, I could not move. Uh, there was, um, like another car beside me that was parked because it was right in front of a store. And so as that truck is coming towards me, I remember it, I said it, you know, this is how it's going to end. I always wondered how I was going to go. I did, and, and I was, you know what, I started to see my family, I started to see um, just things I hadn't accomplished, but I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm saying it's okay, and the car's coming right at me. And right before it gets at me, another car comes and hits it, and, and the red truck goes into a building. Um, it was from that moment there that, yes, I was happy to be alive, but then I just thought about something. It wasn't, God didn't save me that day uh, because I was, I prayed a prayer or anything that morning, or I was just this sanctified, holy person that God actually needs on earth so to complete his will, right? God doesn't need Timothy Robinson to do anything. But one thing that I did learn from that whole situation that I always kept from that thing is that God is sovereign over life and death. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that, that at any moment, at any time, we could be taken out. God does not need us. And so the fact that he, I'm still alive here today and talking to you means that he had a purpose for me. And I, and I kept that with me for a very long time. That's what we're going to be talking about today is the sovereignty of God. And how James gets to talking about the sovereignty of God is very interesting. That's why we have to start in verse 11. He starts talking about brothers and sisters judging each other. And from there he gets to, a, to why we judge each other, the root of the problem. This week online I saw a shirt that read, Jesus judges me. And then through the judges, the word judges, there was a line through it. And then under it says, Jesus loves me. So Jesus judges me, slash to it, Jesus loves me. You get it? That's, that's what the shirt said. The company selling the shirt was a Christian company, and 
many people that were supporting the company, there was you could leave a comment at the bottom, and and many of them were saying, you know, Amen. Finally, somebody gets it. Jesus loves me. Jesus does not judge me. And um, the shirt is very misleading, to say the least. You know, Jesus says in John 5, 40, 45, I don't have to judge you. You've already been judged before the Father by Moses. You see, the law, the law of God proves that we're all guilty. The verdict is already in. Everyone is guilty. And the law of God proves that we're all guilty. No one can keep the law. That's why we needed a Savior. All of us are guilty, but there are some of us who have escaped the, the judgment or the wrath to come because we've placed our faith in Christ. That's the only difference. There's only two types of people on this earth, saved and unsaved. No one can boast in anything. So as we dig deeper into this judging topic, we're going to see where it all comes from. If you look at your text, um, do not speak against one another, brethren, verse, verse 11. That sounds a lot like Matthew 7, 1 through 2. If you haven't read it, I believe I have a slide here for you. It says in Matthew 7, 1 through 2, this is Jesus speaking. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And in James 4, he's saying, do not speak against one another, brethren. One thing we've seen through this study is that James is... Always really going back to the teachings of Jesus, always going back to the teachings of Jesus or the Old Testament Psalms. So clearly he has Jesus in mind when he writes this text. So these, these passages right here, James and Matthew, they're, they're typically used against Christians who go against the, the moral judgment of the majority. These verses are also used by Christians against each other. If you say anything to anyone, you know, they say, do not judge me or why are you judging me? But we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus telling us not to judge? Is James telling us here not to judge? And then you have to also ask yourself, why are you bringing this up anyway? Because we, we just saw early in the letter, remember this is one letter, you've already discussed conflict and how we should really love each other and embrace each other. So if someone's judging someone, that's kind of not going to, that's kind of works against us engaging with each other and being with each other or peace among each other. So what does all this mean? Well, as I was studying this, you, you'll see that the judging topic leads to something more insidious than just being a judgmental person. But I must answer the question first. The, question, the answer to the question is no. Jesus did not tell us not to judge. Jesus told us how to judge. If you actually read all of Matthew 7, Jesus tells us to look at ourselves First, take the log out of your eye, and then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. He tells us basically not to be a hypocrite. And then he tells us how to judge. Jesus says, in the way you judge, you will be judged. So you see, Jesus wanted us to avoid that harsh, uh, merciless judgment, you know, that condemning to hell stuff that we do sometimes, uh, where there's no love for that person. He wanted us... To do it a different way. I remember growing up in Louisiana, I would always, you know, sitting around with my family members, I would always hear them talking about other family members who were always in trouble. And they'd say, you know, Jesus himself cannot save that person. Or Jesus himself cannot change that person. And then, you know, my auntie would be like, mm hmm, that person, mm hmm, too far gone. You know, those, those kind of <laughs> conversations would happen down south. And then it was interesting as I got older before Christ, those conversations were about me. And it was saying, you know, and so it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't good to be on the other side of that. But how can we make such judgments when our hands are dirty too? How can we say that when Jesus changed us and so many more, so many testimonies, we can go on days and days for people in here. How can we say that? How can we say that God cannot change a person? I mean, just this Wednesday night, if you were here for the missions meeting, we just heard about an ex-Muslim who prayed for his mother for 15 years and then she was saved. I mean, that's the type of stuff that we hear all the time. How can we say God can't change someone? And then Jesus himself tells us to do church discipline. We didn't make this up. God himself gave us church discipline. And Paul tells us that we should do church discipline. Church discipline requires you judging the actions of others. So God wants us to do it, to do it his way. I like what Jesus says. It's called righteous judgment in John 7, 24. We ought to look at ourselves and also help other brothers and sisters walk 
in the Lord away from sin. So this is what James is saying right here in the text. He's trying to get us to see the root of our harsh treatment and our condemning towards our brothers and sisters in the faith. And we see the root of the problem in verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? James, who just told us not to be in conflict with each other, is now saying when you speak these careless or slanderous, these critical accusations against each other's believers, other believers, you are setting yourself up as the judge of the law. Now keep in mind, when James says the law in the book of James, he's not just talking about the Old Testament law, he's also he's talking about the word of God itself. So he's saying, when you speak these these things against your brother or your sister, you've made yourself a judge of the law. But you also work against the law when you speak against another brother and sister in a slanderous way. So you can't judge the law and also sin against the law at the same time. How can you judge the law and sin against it at the same time? And right here, James gives us the root of the problem of this harsh judgment from the people of God. He says right there, but who are you who judge your neighbor? Who are you who judge your neighbor? There's only one lawgiver and judge, Jesus Christ. Who are you to judge them? So James basically is saying there's an identity crisis going on. There's an identity crisis going on to the people that he's writing to. There's an identity crisis with unbelievers and believers, period. You see, the, the people that he's writing to, they're pronouncing their own verdicts over the spiritual destiny of people because they believe they can do that because they believe they are God. They're acting, if, if they're acting in a way that only God can really truly act. Now, it's easy today to see that there's an identity crisis. There's an identity crisis in manhood. There's an identity crisis in womanhood. And, and what seems so clear and simple in Genesis Sin has distorted. So since we're all affected by sin, of course there's going to be an identity crisis in the church. So who are you? The root of the problem is the wrong mindset about who we are, who God is, and this life we live. So this thought carries the rest of the message that I'm going to give you today from James today. The root of the problem is a wrong mindset about who we are, this life we live. And who God is. Now, James starts by talking to the merchants, merchants and business people. There's this theme of wealth that we're going to see through the text, which makes sense. When it comes to confusing who we are, wealth is wealth and money is the strongest drug. Money makes you forget where you came from. Money thinks that you actually have some control over people and things. Amen. Money makes you feel powerful. And the poor covet you, and they think that you're powerful. If you remember in chapter 2, this was the problem. Because the Jews were persecuted, they started to start doing things of favoritism. They started to lust after being rich. It makes sense. I mean, when you're being persecuted, you know, you probably should deny Christ, live a regular life. And James is saying, no, 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 you don't do that. You see, people who are rich, they don't understand they're on a slippery slope. And what it means by slippery slope, some of you have probably fallen this winter already, I have. But what you understand, before you fall, there's some hope that you're not going to fall. Do you get what I'm saying? So you're, you're trying to stay up, you know. But at the end of the day, you're going, I always fall. You're going to fall on ice. You're going to fall. And that's what he's saying right here. People who are rich think that they're okay because they have money. They're on a slippery slope. So look at verse 13. He says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. And make a profit. So these business-minded people are saying today or tomorrow we are going to go. You see, they're independent. And during this time, they're financially well off just to go like that. Have you, can anyone just get up and go like that? And I, I see these commercials all the time about Bermuda. And I'm like, man, let's go. And it's like, back to reality, I'm broke. So we can't just <laughs> go. You, you get what I'm saying? But these people, they can just go. They also say, we're going to go to this city. They're saying, this is where we want to go. 
They're motivated by profit. So they've looked at all the stats, they've looked at all the statistics, and they're saying, you know what, this is the city where we're going. This is what we're going to do. And then they say, we're going to spend a year there engaging in business. So now, not only are we going to this city, this is how long we are going to stay there. You see, they're making all the decisions. They, they, they're, they're making all the decisions based on profit, based on stats and statistics and what the things people have told them. And then they say, we are going to make a profit. We know for a fact that if we do this and do that and set up this and set up that, we are going to make a profit. Now, you can imagine these type of individuals. Uh, we may have some of, you, some of these type of people in the room right now. You're always thinking about the next move in your life. You're always thinking about what's going to be best for you, especially when it comes to finances. Maybe you get, actually, maybe you get paid to think like that, like that's your job. Maybe you're a CEO of something or you're a business partner. I want to clear up something before we go further. There is nothing wrong with planning. Jesus tells us that. I'm not just saying that because I feel that. Jesus tells us there's nothing wrong with planning. In fact, Jesus discussing counting the cost of being a disciple, he gives us examples of planning before setting out to accomplish his goals. I love this in Luke 14, 28. He says, for which of you, this is Jesus speaking, for which of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it, right? Jesus is saying, who does that? Who doesn't plan? And in Proverbs 21, 5, it says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So no, there is nothing wrong with planning. But here is what's wrong with planning. is when you have a heart that is arrogant and it neglects to take into account the sovereignty of God. And also it neglects to take into the account the brevity of life. So whether you're in business or not, it doesn't matter. All people must have a correct view of God themselves and life. There, there's no true view of God or yourself or life when you talk like these business-minded people do. If you're waking up every morning saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go here, I'm going to make a profit, it's going to be great. There's no true view of life or God or who you are. And today, even in the church, there's no true view of God or this life. Our mindset matters. A lot of people are trying to have church without God. You can't do that. How you think about your life will affect how you live. And here's the, the worst part about it. How you talk about life to others affect how they look at God. So how you view God affects you. But it's going to affect your heart. So it's going to affect the way you talk. And it's going to affect others. And we have that example from the text. It says, come now, you who say... You who say, James really has a problem with the way people talk, as we've noticed throughout the study, right? James says, the way you talk, and the reason why he has such a problem with the way you talk, because it's, it's coming from your heart. Your heart is only, what comes out of your mouth is what, what's in your heart. And in their hearts, these business-minded people, in some of our churches, and some of us, there's no regard for Christ. So if you're taking notes, I've broken this into three sections, and we'll get through these. The first one is a correct view of life, a correct view of God, and a correct way to live. A correct view of life, a correct view of God, and a correct way to live. 